and anticipate that we will be pruned or purged. Like the apple tree that we use as our illustration, if we're to produce the best fruit for God's glory, we will have to experience that process. And it is a process. It will not take you long, especially going through basic training, going through AIT, to know that things come after a process. And that process through different difficulties we undoubtedly go through and we don't like it. Many, many times we want the power, but we don't want the process that we go through to get that power, do we? But we have to do that. But think about this. How about when we go through those difficulties? Like I said before, we don't like it. It's uncomfortable. We'd really rather be elsewhere or have something else going on. We'd really rather just have easy times and just get to what we're planning to get to. Those of you that have been waiting or will be waiting to go to your duty station, brother, you know what I'm talking about right there. It's a difficult process having to have that patience knowing that you've graduated, you're MOS qualified, but yet you're still sitting here. But it's a process. Just like that we talked about last week, we as God's people have to go through that pruning process. We have to go through that purging process. Why? Because it is necessary for us to bear the best fruit. So we're going to keep on that theme this morning, talking about when we're going through those difficulties. And I turn your attention to the book of James, chapter number 1. Starting in verse number 1, James tells us these words. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearances perish. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Verse number 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And this morning I'll preach on this subject, joy in trials. Let's pray. Almighty God, now that we come to this portion of worship where we read your word, where we hear it spoken, Lord, I pray that you will just bless us, that you'd move among us, that you'd speak to us. Lord, may may every amount of preparation that I've done to preach this sermon be glorifying to you, and may you say what needs to be said here. Move me out of the way and come through me and, and say to your people what needs to be said this very morning. May your Spirit move among us, convict us, and challenge us. I pray this in the mighty name of Christ our Savior. And all of God's people said... Amen. So, James writes here to the family of God. In the very first, um, uh, uh, not the first verse, but the second verse, he says, My brethren, you this morning, you know Christ is Lord and Savior. You are part of the family of God. We who, who know the name of Christ, who trust in the name of Christ, and it's my prayer that everybody under the sound of my voice has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, Therefore, you are part of God's family. Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us, having been justified by faith. You know Christ this morning. You have been justified, and that means declared righteous by God through your faith in Christ. And more than that, you've become part 
of God's family. Now, you know, here on earth, we have differing um, shades, if you will, of family. Uh, some are traditional, some are non-traditional. The bottom line is we're part of some kind of family here on earth. But oh, aren't you glad that because you know Christ as Lord and Savior, you are part of the family of God. I'm reminded of that old hymn. I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God. I've been washed, by, washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. <clears throat> And you become that child of God, part of God's family, through faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 and verse number 12 tells us these words, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. So you know Christ this morning, you've placed your faith in His name. He's given you the right to become children of God, part of the family of God. So James starts out calling them his brethren. We put it in modern day English, brethren and sisterin. Because we're all part of the family of God. But James writes about something else, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning. James also writes about joys and trials. He's, he tells us under God's inspiration that we are to see trials as joy. But you might be thinking to yourself, how can this be? Trials are not joyful. Let me ask you a question, uh, initial entry training students or former in initial entry training students. How joyful are the trials that you've been through in this journey? Not very joyful. How joyful are the trials that you found yourself in when you were back home and things of that nature? Not very joyful. So you, you say to yourself, how can we be joyful in them? What an intriguing question. How can we be joyful in trials? Of course, we know that the easy answer to our trials, we talked about it last week, is to exhibit our humanity, to get mad, to throw things, to do whatever we do in frustration. But I remind you, what does that give us? Absolutely nothing. But as we look to the instruction that James gives us today. I believe we can glean four answers to this simple question, how can we be joyful in times of trial? So we can be joyful in times of trial, number one, because we can look past our trials. We can look past our trials. In verse number three, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And what does patience do? Patience not only gives us the ability to weather whatever storm we're in right now, but it also gives us the ability to look forward to better things. It gives us the ability to look forward to better things. You remember a little while ago I asked you if you all were tracking the fact that Christmas is coming? That's a better thing, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can look forward to better things through our patience. But more than that, patience looks beyond today's clouds to sunshine. Let me give you an illustration. Back when I was stationed in Hawaii, I was um, a CID chaplain. Y'all know what CID is? Criminal investigation. You know what it is. You told me you, you thought about becoming one one day. But... As part of my battlefield circulation, I had agents in Alaska, in Korea, in Japan. So I got a chance to go all over the Pacific, and it was a lot of fun. But I remember my very last trip as a CID chaplain. I was going to, to Alaska one last time. But that weekend, I was supposed to leave on a Sunday. That weekend, a hurricane, it didn't come, come over us, but it came around us, and so naturally we got all the rain and everything from it. And so it did that all day Saturday, and it was still raining on Sunday morning. So got up, and we went to the airport. I told my wife, I said, Be, you know, keep your phone with you because they could cancel it. But they didn't cancel it. Still got on the plane and still lifted off to go to Alaska. But I tell you what was so wondrous about this. 
By the way, y'all have been on a plane when you've taken off in the rain and you see the rain peel off of the windows? That's pretty cool. But here's what was so wondrous about that. We were in the midst of the aftermath of that hurricane that was making its way on, on across the Pacific. And so it was heavy rain, heavy clouds. Take off on the airplane, though. And then after a few minutes, we were above that cloud. And it was sunshine. You see, our patience looks beyond today's clouds to sunshine. Reminder, patience or long-suffering, as it said in some translations of the Bible, is one of the fruits of the Spirit. We talked about that last week when we talked about growing the best fruit for God's kingdom. But more than that, Jesus set the example at the cross. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, our, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Think about that. For the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus knows a little bit about looking past what's going on right now for the joy that will follow. And it says it right here in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. Make no mistake about it, the pain and the shame of the cross made it a terrible trial. I don't know if any of you have ever cut yourself or maybe mistakenly put a nail into your finger or something, but it doesn't feel good, does it? Imagine Jesus as he was whipped and beaten and then hung upon the cross and nailed to the cross. And that made it a terrible trial. But Jesus looked beyond that. He looked beyond these things to the joy that would follow. What joy? Well, first and foremost, going back to the Father. Sitting at the Father's right hand. Being that that conduit, if you will, between us and God to where we can go to God with our prayers, with the things on our heart, and know that God is going to help. But more joy than that, the joy that Jesus has knowing that millions will call upon His name in faith. So Jesus knows a little bit about looking forward to the joy that will follow. Because like I said, joy was ahead for Jesus after the cross. The joy of that resurrection, defeating the grave and ascension to the Father. The joy of knowing the coming rapture in His kingdom. Oh, things look difficult now. But hang on for the ride because one way or another, the rapture is going to come. Either we're going to see it or we're going to witness it from, from, from heaven. But it's going to come and that's a joy. And then the joy of millions saved and sharing heaven with them. Those are joys. You see, Jesus didn't save us or didn't offer salvation just so he could keep that to himself. He offers salvation so that he can have the joy of all of us coming to know him and spending eternity with him. So yes, there are trials, but we can look past them. Joy is past those trials. But another reason that we can be joyful in times of trial is that we can look for the potential for good in our trials. Verse number 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. That, y'all didn't know that word was in the Bible, did you? Liberally. And that, that, that has a bad connotation nowadays, but in, in this context, it means that God gives you everything. He doesn't hold back. He's not going to just say, you can have this blessing, but not this blessing. He gives to all liberally. So there are trials, but we can be joyful because we can look past them and because we can look for the potential for good in those trials. Y'all heard the phrase, hunt the good stuff, right? We can look for the potential for good in our trials. Believe it or not, there are lessons to be learned in times of trial. Sometimes I have difficulty with that one. Simply because I don't, I'm, just as, I'm just as guilty as anyone else. I like the power but not the process that it takes to get there. So I get impatient. And I'm like, what lesson am I to learn from this? And I have to turn back and say, I know there is a lesson, God, but I have to wait on you to teach it to me. 
But there are lessons to be learned in whatever trial that we go through. But more than that, there are changes to be made in us through whatever trial we go through. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, um, Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Let me ask you a question. Did that verse say that all things are good to him that love God? Or did it say that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord? It said the latter, didn't it? What does that mean? That means whatever trial you're going through, it's turning you into what God wants you to be. You have to let it. You have to let it turn you into what God wants you to be. Because it's going to prov- provide good. The difficulty might not be good. The trial might not be good. Whatever you're going through might not be good. But hang on for the ride because we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So there are changes to be made in us. And we need wisdom to understand what God is doing in those trials, don't we? We we don't have wisdom just automatically, or as I alluded to last week, just because we get to a certain age. We need wisdom to understand what God's doing in our trials. And we can ask for this wisdom and receive it. That's the good news right there. We can ask God to provide us this wisdom and He will do it. But... That wisdom may come through a little bit of trial. But know this. God will impart that wisdom freely to those who ask for it. Freely, without hindering. Who knows, God may be developing a new attitude in you through your trials. He might be activating some talent within you through your trials. He may impart wisdom through another person to us in those trials. But the bottom line is we can always look for the potential for good in our trials. And that's the difficult part. We don't like to do that. We don't like the trial. We don't want to go through the trial. But like I said a minute ago, the only way you're going to get power is through the process. The only way you're going to get power is through the process. How many of y'all ever looked in the dictionary and saw the word process come before power? It doesn't happen, does it? You've got to have the process. So, we can look for the potential for good in our trials. And we can also look to the power of prayer in our trials. Y'all believe prayer has power? Have you ever seen anywhere where the word uh, power comes, bef- comes after prayer in the dictionary? It don't happen either, does it? Or oh, excuse me, I said that wrong. My bad. Old people, got old people's brains. The only place you're going to find the word power coming before prayer is in the dictionary. There we go, that's a good one. Y'all write that down, remember where you heard it. Good, I got some laughs on that one, I'm doing better. But we can look to the power of prayer in our trials, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith. I got this circled in red in my Bible here. Uh, Let him ask in faith. See, that's, that's the key right there. You've got to use your faith. See, that's the reason that we have faith. is because we believe in something higher than us. We believe in a power higher than us. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. See, number one, in faith. Number two, don't doubt. Because you might not see it immediately, right? Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The bottom line is what we're being told here is that if we're not asking in faith, and if we're doubting while we're asking, we're not going to get very far. We're not going to get very far. So let us ask in faith with no doubting. And we're invited to ask for help in times of trial. In fact, I'd go even further than invited and say instructed or commanded to ask for help 
in times of trial. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. You see that right there? We, when we go to God in prayer, we're not coming to somebody that doesn't know what's going on. See, God knows what's going on. He knows the difficulty we're going through. And oh, by the way, He didn't cause that difficulty. But because we're going to have that difficulty, He definitely can use it within us. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sins. Talking about Jesus right there. Jesus, when He walked the earth in the the shell of humanity, He dealt with the same things that we deal with. He dealt with uh, hurts. He dealt with difficulties. He dealt with teasing, scourging, things of that nature. But the good news is, He was without sin. We can't say that about ourselves. We deal with difficulties, temptations, trials, and yet sometimes we're apt to uh, revert to our sinful self versus trying to be more like Christ. But the bottom line I'm trying to make here is He already knows. He knows the road that we're going through. How many in here are 18? 19? All right, and that means you've been uh, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, right? No offense to you in what I'm getting ready to say. And I'm quoting from somebody else. The problem with teenagers is they don't know nothing. The trouble with teenagers is you think you're smarter than those of us that's already been, been down that road. Y'all get that? Now, I did not mean that as any offense to you all, so please don't think that, okay? I bet your parents have probably said it to you as well. But the point I'm trying to make here is God understands because God's been there, right? So we have that high priest who does sympathize with our weakness. When we go to God in prayer, He knows what we're going through and wants to help us. So what we have to do is reach out and and allow Him to help, right? So that grace, the grace of God, it's, it's, uh, it's there to help and it's available in our trials. It's available in the time of need. And one more point on that grace, it is sufficient. It is enough. It is all you need. I remind you of what Paul tells the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Verses 7 through 9, he says these words, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above nature. Basically what Paul's saying right there is, there's some kind of trial that he's going through in his life. He doesn't say what it is, but there's some kind of a difficulty, and he recognizes that that was put into his life so he would not be exalted more than he should have been. Verse number 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. You see, Paul did exactly what we would do. God, take this from me. God, I don't want this in my life. I'm trusting you to take it from me. But verse number 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So that grace that God has is sufficient. It's good enough for whatever you're going through. And oh yes, you're going to have to go through it. And God may not take it away immediately. But when asked, He's going to give you what you need as you walk through that valley. And so, God is there to hear and answer us in our trials. Consider the disciples in the storm. And you remember the story. They're out on the boat. The storm comes up. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. And then they wake him up and they say, Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? And then Jesus stood up and he said, Peace be still. And the storm was calm. Consider Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus. You know the story from John chapter 11. And and Lazarus dies and Jesus gets there and Mary and Martha say, If you had been here, he would not have died. And Jesus felt that that grief. He felt that emotion. The shortest, uh, y'all know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept. And we can pray 
And we can ask others to pray. We forget that sometimes. Or we forget it in reverse. We can ask others to pray, but we can also pray because we have that lifeline to God. And our faith grows as we go through those trials and as we see those prayers answered. I remind you, the prayer might not be answered when we want it answered. Or it might not be the answer that we want. But as we go through the trial and we see ourselves getting through it simply by the grace of God and Him giving us what we need, as we go through it, our faith grows. I could stand up here all day and give you testimonies of how I've seen my faith grow from difficult trials that I've been through. But time will not allow that. The point is, your faith will grow when you trust God through those trials. So we can look to the power of prayer in our trials. Last but not least, we can look to the prize that awaits us after our trials. Verse number 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those that love him. All our trials are temporary. They don't feel that way when we're going through them. They feel like they're going to last and last and last and we're going to take them with us to our grave. But all of our trials are temporary. The Lord offers salvation by faith and then He offers the eternal rewards of that salvation by faith. For those who trust in Jesus, the best is yet to come. Oh yes, there's difficulty. Yes, there's bitterness. Yes, there's hardship. But the best is yet to come. I got a sermon by that title. Y'all have not been graced to hear it. But I'm going to give you the illustration from it. Sound good? I asked you last week how many like apple pie. How many like apple pie? Me too. Does any of y'all's moms make the best in the world? Mine does. All right. Let me tell you what happens. Picture it. We're sitting around at a holiday gathering, be it Thanksgiving, be it Christmas, whatever. And not only is it an awesome meal that we're suddenly a few pounds heavier from. Some of y'all got that. So we're sitting there, as I said, three or four or five or six or ten pounds heavier. And we've eaten the main, de- uh, the main course. And my mom always says, now who wants dessert? Now who's going to turn down dessert? Please. Do y'all turn down dessert? I don't either. Maybe I should, but I don't. And here's what here's what'll happen. She says, Okay, we'll keep your forks. Keep your forks. Child of God, you may have difficulties. You may have trials. You may have hardship along the way. But I want to challenge you today to hold on to your fork because the best is yet to come. So yes, we can be joyful in times of trial. Number one, because we can look past our trials. Number two, because we can look for the potential for good in our trials. Number three, we can look to the power of prayer in our trials. And number four, we can look to the power of, uh, excuse me, we can look to the prize that awaits after our trials. Like I said, trials will come. They're inevitable. They're going to happen. Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 and verse 33, be of good cheer, or excuse me, he says, he says uh, you will have temptations in this world, but he says, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You can count it all joy, though, as James says, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And this morning, I don't know what your status is, My prayer is that everybody under the sound of my voice knows Christ as their Lord and Savior, has been declared righteous by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But if if the case is this morning that you've come to, to worship service, but you've not come to the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you to come to know that saving grace this morning. Jesus went to the cross. He died. He was, he was buried and then rose after three days so that we may have salvation eternal life, victory. So maybe this morning you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. The invitation is open. Maybe this morning you've come to chapel service and you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, but you've, you've been through the trials, you've been through the temptations, and they've gotten you down, and you don't know which way is up. The way is up is looking toward God. So I want to encourage you this morning.
I want to invite you this morning to remember your salvation, remember the author of your faith, remember the reason for your faith, and place your eyes back on that, on that uh, instrument of your faith.